Aloha. Welcome to another episode of Big Tech Hawaii's Education Movers, Shakers, and Reformers. I'm your host, Carl M. Hunt. Many people believe that education can be the silver bullet or the linchpin that can help solve problems like homelessness, drug addiction, social division, and income inequality. And in Hawaii, where our many intertwined cultures cherish our keiki and do all we can to open doors for their successes, we assume that a high priority is placed on having a world-class educational system. But is it? On this show, we talk about the programs available to our keiki, the quality of our facilities and infrastructure, addressing deferred maintenance, increasing the number of cool rooms for our keiki and teachers, a more comprehensive curriculum approach, as well as appropriately recognizing and valuing our teachers and administrative staff. And perhaps most importantly, what life and career opportunities are we providing for our keiki to thrive today and into the future? Brain drain refers to the emigration of a highly skilled or well-educated people away from their home for better pay or conditions, causing their place of local origin to lose those skills and expertise. Hawaii is in a constant struggle to overcome this loss of local brains. Here to discuss this idea with us today is Dr. Margo Edwards. Uh, of her many hats, Dr. Edwards is the current executive director of the University of Hawaii Applied Research Lab. Margo, welcome to the show. Hi, Carl. Thanks for having me. No, I'm looking forward to this. Is, you're actually the very first University of Hawaii person that we've had on the show. Well. So I truly appreciate that. Looking forward to more coming. So first of all, tell us a bit about your role at UH. Uh, so I'm a researcher. I'm a geologist at the University of Hawaii. I was um, teaching for a little while, but most of the time I spent doing research, and now I'm doing a lot of uh, administration. We could call it cat herding, but <laughs> it's administration <laughs> for the university. So that's, uh, that means you've been promoted. <laughs> yeah, uh, I would say that. It, it means that I get to be involved with a lot of different subject areas than I used to be. So I used to worry about underwater volcanoes, and now I worry about underwater volcanoes, and I think about the Arctic, but I also get to know people who blast rockets uh, off into space. I get to meet people who study uh, whether there are anti-neutrinos passing through the Earth. Um, it's pretty wow. exciting. That yeah. is fascinating, and that's all within uh, the Applied Research Lab. Yes, well, a and outside at the University of Hawaii proper, there are a lot of people that I get to meet there, too. Excellent, excellent. Well, um, all right, so briefly, just so we have this succinct answer, um, with regards to ARL, Applied Research Lab, what is that? It, 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 you sort of summarized it, but encapsulated it if there's like one comment. What does ARL do? So ARL is basically the connector between the University of Hawaii and uh, state security and federal security. So Department of Defense, both for Hawaii and for the federal on the federal side. What's that connector to be able to help Hawaii, help the Navy, help Hawaii, help the Adjutant General for the State of Hawaii protect? And so we take a bunch of the research. I'm not being short, sorry. That's a bunch okay. of the research that we develop at the University of Hawaii and use that to, to apply it to a particular problem. For example, you might come up with a sensor that measures what the surface of the ocean looks like for one application, but state civil defense might need to measure it for another application. So what we do is we develop a lot of technologies that are dual use and help get them Okay. to the people who need them. Excellent. So this, um, so this is research. It also provides jobs. That's exactly why I thought it would be good for me to be here is because yeah. I really see one of the fundamental roles of the ARL is helping to develop this high-tech workforce that we spend a lot of time in the state of Hawaii talking about. Which is really relevant in a number of areas. Um, and it's actually, in many people's opinions, it is really one of the jobs, one of the desired outcomes, I should say, of, of a university, uh, of any state university or of any university, is that it has that sort of connection. It has that development process. It creates these brains that we can then put to work immediately throughout the state. Um, and then, well, elsewhere, I suppose, which is where we get to our topic of brain drain here a little bit. So, OK, well, excellent. Um, OK, so speaking of brain drain, what are your thoughts? Well, uh, there's, there's one really important message that I, I want to 
sort of get out there and hopefully it's controversial enough that everybody will call you and want to be on your show. But <laughs> I think there's a really fundamental disconnect between what we're saying is happening at the University of Hawaii, for example, or in the state education system at, in the whole, and what we see on the eighth page of the newspaper, right? So I'm referring to the fact that, you know, recently I saw an article that said there were 30 amazing valedictorians coming out of Kalani High School, going to all of these top tier educational institutions, that there are there has been forever a powerhouse of robotics up in Waipahu. And then yet we, we continue to talk about how bad things are, you know, and how we need to fix the system. And the same is true for the University of Hawaii. We talk about, you know, the University of Hawaii has this problem and they can't manage themselves. But the fact of the matter is that the University of Hawaii is doing exceedingly well. And so one of the things that I came on your show to be controversial about was to say that we need to change the marketing. And maybe what we need to do is take back ownership, particularly of the University of Hawaii, from the media. You know, so what I'm seeing portrayed in the media doesn't really reflect the people that I meet and work with on a daily basis. Yeah, I think there's probably truth in that. I mean, media takes something and it's, they, they prefer something that's sensational. They prefer a story that has a human interest to it that is going to draw attention and make everybody want to read or watch uh, what, their, what their story is about. Um, but I, I, I'll agree with you, uh, so it doesn't make it that controversial, I suppose, but I'll agree with you on one side that not enough attention is paid to what quality happens and where that quality is and where the opportunities are. Um, you know, for, for example, I'm aware that one of the recent hires that you have is actually directly out of the university system. And that's uh, uh, Tyler, we won't say his last name at the moment, but mm -hmm. Tyler. He uh, went and got his bachelor's degree, a master's degree, and now he has, he is employed through ARL. Um, so he's got, he's one of the new local kids that has one of these brains that we need to keep here. Mm -hmm. That we need to develop and encourage, that we need to let, really we need to we can use that as example, maybe not him personally in his name, but use that as example as, look, there are opportunities. You're a bright, intelligent boy, girl. You have these skill sets. We can use you here, and there are ways that we can use you here. And I think that sometimes we don't always know where our, our careers can lead. Sometimes we don't always know what we can do and what opportunities are exist. So it's hard to make those choices, especially when you're 18 years old. Well, I want to go to college, but I don't know what to do, right? So to, to be able to have more of the story be about what the opportunities are and what the realities are and what the actualized goals are through education, I think that can help a lot. Um, so again, that, that's agreeing with you. Uh, but I'm going to jump back on that and say, the problem is we can't always just say, look, we have all these kids from Kalani High School that went all these great schools, Ivy League schools and you know, Ivy League of the West schools, right. when we have a number of other schools that don't produce that, a number of other schools that don't have what seems to be the same level of funding or the same level of opportunity. And I'm not going to argue with you about that. I think that we, you know, we definitely have some problems in Hawaii and in every state that you have to deal with in terms of education. I don't think that that's unique. But I, I have to wonder if there's a frustrated majority of Tylers out in the state of Hawaii who have their degrees from the University of Hawaii and are almost embarrassed about saying it, like, you know, in the days when a college student was a Clinton supporter, but everybody wanted Bernie, you know, and so you didn't say out loud who you wanted to support because the majority was going, in your peer group, was going a different way. I grew up in Southern California, and going to USC, going to UCLA, those were seen as great things. If you go to Seattle and you go to the University of Washington, right, and then you go to the high-tech industry around there, you're going to get a job. UW is seen very highly. Guess what? In many, many fields, UW ranks lower than the University of Hawaii. So what is it here in the state that we find so unacceptable about our one flagship university that we don't say to the Tylers, great, you're from the University of Hawaii, you got a job. 
Yeah. That's the culture that I think that we need to change. And if we start changing that culture so that the high school kids that are the brightest, instead of wanting to go to the mainland, instead of feeling like UH is a fallback position, look at what we're doing with space flight, look at what we're doing with microbiology at the University of Hawaii and say, that's my first choice. Yeah. Then we start to change this culture. I really think there's a perception that's a big part of the problem. That perception is a combination of factors. That perception comes from media, but based on, well, things that have happened. But also it's based on a number of individuals, legislators included, who've decided to use UH as, as I think, an arguing point. Um, and have attacked UH and have continued to go after to reduce funding and then say, well, you're not doing your job, we're going to take money away. Well, but if you're not, from a university perspective, the more money you take away, the less you're able to do. Um, so it seems counterproductive right. in that regard. So I, I would suggest, as part of this um, controversial idea, is to, is to say, yes, we need to promote this. We need to promote this younger. We need to re make sure that we are connecting, and this is the next point to get to, that I kind of want to wait until our, our next segment to jump into, but we need to bring this to the attention and say these are the positives, and these are the opportunities, and make sure that the kids recognize, oh, you know what, there's a real path, and how do we connect those dots, and how do we help them connect those dots? Because you have kids, right? Yep. They don't know how to connect the dots. Right. How would they know how to connect the dots? Right. That's why we're there, to help them and point out, oh, by the way, you like this? Here are some possibilities. So um, we're going to take a quick break. So that was a really quick first segment, but we're going to take a quick break. So thank you again for joining us. This is Think Tech Hawaii's Education Movers, Shakers, and Reformers. I'm your host, Carl Campagna. And today we have with us Dr. Margo Edwards. We'll see you in a minute. Thanks. I'm Jay Fidel, and I'm here with Pete McGinnis-Mark to talk about HIGP and research in Manoa. What about that show, Pete? I think it's great, Jay. Research at Manoa really provides faculty members at the University of Hawaii with an easy way of explaining some of the research activities we're conducting on the campus. For example, I do a lot of space research, whether it's the Moon and Mars, but many of my other colleagues do other interesting kinds of work, whether it's exploring the ocean floor in submarines, studying earthquakes and tsunamis or other activities. So research at Manoa really provides us with a way of telling the general public some of the activities which we're involved in as well as communicating to our colleagues and students. This is a fun science, and we really appreciate the activities which Research of Manoa enable us to talk about. I love Research of Manoa. Come around, join us. It's Monday, 1 o'clock p.m., every single Monday. Be there or be square. <laughs> Aloha, I'm Kawi Lucas, host of Hawaii is My Mainland, every Friday here on Think Tech Hawaii. I also have a blog of the same name at kawilucas.com where you can see all of my past shows. Join me this Friday and every Friday at 3 p.m. Aloha. Welcome back to Think Tech Hawaii's Education Movers, Shakers, and Reformers. Once again, I'm your host, Carl Kimpan. And to revisit, today we have with us, our guest today is Dr. Margo Edwards from the University of Hawaii Applied Research Lab. Thanks once again for joining us. We have been talking about brain drain and which means losing our young minds to other locations, other locales, other regions, whether it's university in California, university anywhere throughout the rest of the continent, or they've gotten a job somewhere else. So one way or another, the state has lost that, that resource of their mind. Um, so that's brain drain. Uh, there, some people say there are pros and cons to that. Um, I see it mostly as a con because we don't, we're not really providing at least the, the knowledge of the opportunities that may exist, which create more opportunities potentially. So, but let's, let's, let's take a look at, let's, the next thought that I have is, what are possible solutions to overcoming mm. that challenge? What do you think, what are your thoughts from what you have seen from within the university, and what you've heard from outside the university, what, what are some of your thoughts about overcoming this? Well, I think something that you said, I want to tag on something that you said in the previous segment, which is getting to the kids younger, right? So 
I was thinking of an example on the drive here. Let's pick coral reefs because of all the states in the nation, Hawaii is the one that's yeah. best at addressing coral reefs. We have an amazing facility at the Hawaii Institute of Marine Biology over at Coconut Island. We have world-class leaders over there. They are teaching students in college who are reaching out to students in high school who could be reaching out to students in elementary school, right? So you have the kids in elementary school who already love fish, right? I've seen Dory, you've seen Dory, right? Oh, I'm about and, to go. <clears throat> okay, <laughs> and you know, they already love fish, they grow up in this environment, they care about what's happening to the planet, and they have a natural laboratory, most of them in their backyards. Let's develop the program that gets the hands-on experience so that by the time a five-year-old is now a 20-year-old, all they want to do is help solve the coral reef problem. It has become so important to them, so ingrained in them that A, they can make a difference. B, this is something that they care about that focuses on their home, right? That they don't have any desire to go to Stanford where there's no coral reefs or MIT where there's no coral reefs. I mean, the top tier colleges don't have so many of the things that we, because of this amazing Hawaiian environment, can offer. So let's focus on those things. Let's get our keiki involved with developing those from the time they can walk and talk, practically. I, I agree with that. I agree with that. Um, now I am going to go controversial. And see, you don't have to go here if you don't want to. But it's not just marine biology, it's not just coral reefs, mm -hmm. it's across the board. What does the University of Hawaii offer from their engineering program, from their law program, from their space and science and technology program? Mm -hmm. And this brings us to the controversial part, and that is TMT. Mm -hmm. um, it's controversial because some people are against it, other people are for it. I, don't, I think in the end, my, my thought on it is People aren't against what the idea is. What they're against is, well, the inappropriate usage of sacred lands. Okay, so we don't, that's the controversial part. We can put that aside. The question is, and the point is, utilizing all of these educational opportunities and how they lead to careers, whether they are careers at the university from an institution perspective, or they are careers in the professional world, business related, commercial related, as far as a product development or system development, to address these local concerns, to address our energy and food security needs, to address our homeless needs and concerns. Uh, so again, Tyler, going back to Tyler again, um, he'll appreciate this a little bit, I think. Um, <laughs> Tyler has a master's degree in urban and rural planning. He's 23 years old, and to have that level of education and knowing that, you know what, we are at the beginning of what needs to happen going forward with regards to this energy food challenge that we have and, and in so many other areas. So being able to, so I'll, I'll jump back from that and say using that and saying, okay, here's this broad spectrum of opportunities. We have some world-class professors in the engineering department, world-class professors, and, and what we need to do is make sure that that's clear. Make sure that people respect that and that we are helping to build that up. Because we let me get your thought on this. What is the purpose of a university to educate? What else are the perhaps ancillary benefits of a university? What other things from a social perspective, from an economic, uh, economic perspective, what other opportunities are, are there as a result of there being a university in our state? Yeah, I, I think that the economic one is the obvious one. I mean, the idea of a university as ivory, ivory tower has been, you know, in my mind, just shattered for a long time now. We're not there just to impart our great wisdom to these students. We are members of our community, and we should be down in the community with our sleeves rolled up trying to solve these problems, right? Trying to train the next workforce that's going to solve the problems, and in hiring that workforce, helping the economy, right? Because I've given you a job with my research dollars to be able to, you know, raise your family here and pay for food at Foodland, right? right. So, I mean, there's... Which has been barged in, by the way. <clears throat> yeah, well, <laughs> and that's another thing. Thing. I mean, you're 100% you're right when you say it doesn't have to just be coral reefs. Yeah. You know, we can, we can definitely talk about all kinds of, of problems that, that the people of Hawaii can, 
can solve. But what we need to get away from, I think, is this mindset, especially in my generation and older, that, you know, it's okay for these kids to go find themselves on the mainland. It's less expensive because, you know, a, a top heavy, an elder heavy society is not a society that's going to be sustainable. We have to keep these young people here with their brains and their solutions to the problems that you've enumerated Agreed. so that we can, we can solve it. Agreed. There's, it's a combination of power and knowledge vacuum. Right. Because what happens when that level retires? or disappears through one means or another, then, and there's nobody ready. Uh, where's the structure that's saying, okay, we've got these people lined up to start taking over as a natural progression. No one ever wants to, I mean, no one ever wants to give up something that they're in charge of uh, when it's their passion. Uh, but at some point it becomes necessary. At some point there needs to be a passing of the baton. Right. Um, so, again, so that goes to how do we how do we inform these children? How do we engage our kids? And at what age, and this is one of your questions from, uh, from your email you sent me, at what age is an appropriate age to begin the conversation with these children to start leading them down some of these paths that are available to them? Right. So uh, what, are, what are your thoughts on that? What's a good age to start? Well, I think it depends on the problem. For example, the coral reef problem, you could start very, very young, right, and get kids engaged in that. The homeless problem is some, probably something that you want to wait till children are older and maybe a little bit more empathetic, a little bit more used to sort of, you know, kinds of social issues. Um, it, there, I don't think that there is a clear-cut answer, but the, the point is that it isn't high school. Right? If we're starting at high school, we're starting too late. If we're starting at college, the barn door is already shut. It yeah. needs to be happening well in advance of that, depending on what the subject is. And you know, the teachers that I've met, both at the private schools and the public schools in elementary, they're getting this. You know, I see them out there with their you know, buckets on the beach collecting sand so that the kids can go through and, and start studying you know, how much sand versus how many bottle caps, you know, what's pollution doing to our environment. It's, it's not, there are problems with the educational system that we need to work on and fix. But I really think that a fundamental issue that takes so little effort is just for you and me to say, we're going to change our mindset. And instead of focusing on what's wrong, yeah. we're going to start highlighting what's right. Yeah. I would love to hear that the next time that, you know, the newspaper is talking about a wonder blunder or whatever it is, you know, that a hundred letters to the editor come in and say, why are you talking about a $200,000 thing when in the same time period the university has raised $300 million in research? How many pages are you devoting to this? versus that. Right, Let's right. devote the pages to that. Instead, what they'll do is they'll say, yeah, that's $300 million in research, but then they're going to start jumping into, how, but how, how is that money spent? Yeah. They're going to start, because they're looking for that kind of need. Instead of, what are the benefits? What are the positives? Let's remember those positives as well. I think that both need to be analyzed. Both need to be understood, because when there are problems, we need to know it. We need to be aware of it so we can make the adjustments. However, we also need to recognize the value, the benefits, the opportunities that are there. Uh, the university is opportunity. That's what university, to me, growing up, all I could imagine was, oh, going, going to college, going to university, that, just, that, that means my life begins. I, I didn't know what that meant when I was 12, I, but I knew that, that meant, that's when my life really began. That's when I was really starting to get into what I was going to do, hopefully. Um, doesn't always work out that way, but, it, but, but at the same point, though, that is uh, philosophically. A lot of people say, well, I was born here, but I really became who I am as a person mm -hmm. in college. Mm -hmm. I don't, I, almost everybody that I've spoken to can agree with that. Like, well, yeah, I became me in college because that's where we really not only learn a specialty, especially if we've gone to master's and PhD, but we've learned ourselves. And that's one of the values, and that's a personal value. But then there's the, there's the academic value. There's the professional value. Right. There's the community value. And that's when we start to have a little bit of social and economic opportunities. Uh, how many colleges out there, as we think about you know, throughout the entire continent, 
how many colleges are the, have been the center point of social change. And that's an important thing too, right? Yeah, well, I was just thinking, you know, in terms of your Tyler example, and you're going to have to go back and give him, I think, uh, <laughs> <coughs> some compensation for using his name so much. But, you know, in terms of your Tyler example, it was the university that educated him and research that's now giving him the opportunity to become part of the solution, part of the economic solution, yeah. right? I mean... That's the things that we need to be able to sell. That's the story that we want to tell. Agreed. Agreed. Absolutely agreed. And that's, where, that's why I brought him up. And again, I'm not using his last name because I don't want to have to you know, compensate him later. No, <laughs> I'm kidding. He, he would be very thrilled because he, he agrees. He and I have talked about this. He agrees. Um, but yes, he is one of the examples of, oh, by the way. Um, and not every, not every child has the same motivation that mm -hmm. he has had that has gotten him to where he is now. Mm. And that goes into the whole other concept of, well, some children aren't ready. They're not ready to be guided yet towards any sort of career idea when they're 10, 12 years old. They're not ready for that. They just wanna play still. They wanna stay in the playground. Mm -hmm. uh, but we need to start transitioning. Uh, um, I'm, I've always been friendly of the belief, the more knowledge available, the better because then you can make choices. If you don't have the knowledge, if you've not been provided with options, you don't know what choice to make or that you can even make choices. Mm. So even my, even my son who's 10 years old, when I talk to him and what I've been telling him for years, I go, by the way, what are the things you like? What do you enjoy doing? You know that there's a career about that, right? Mm. You can go become a mathematician. You can go become a NASA scientist. You can go do just letting him know all these possibilities are exist. So he's come back to me a couple times and said, well, okay, if I wanted to go do that, wh what are the best schools that I can go to? I was like, now that's the conversation that I want to have with my 10-year-old. Right. What are the best schools? You can go to MIT. Well, I would, you know, yes, you could. But you know what? The University of Hawaii, let's go see what is there. Yeah. That's one of the next steps. Especially if you want to go work for NASA. <laughs> I'd go to <laughs> there UH. Are opportunities. There are opportunities there. So. Yeah. Um, okay, I think our time is done. But thank you very much. I appreciate it. I think it's a great conversation and I think it requires easily another couple of hours worth of really digging deep in. Um, I agree that the university needs a lot more attention for the good. Um, the, the, the bad is already there and the bad is being worked on and will continue to be. Mm -hmm. But the good needs to be recognized so that we are providing that pathway uh, for, our for our children, for our kids uh, at an earlier age as more and more things are getting earlier and earlier, sometimes it's good, sometimes it's bad. I think it's child-specific, mm -hmm. as, as well as age-specific sometimes. But thank you again for joining us. Look forward to having you come back again. If there's a specific project or some specific thing you want to come talk about, please come back. Okay. Um, and look forward, so thank you again. Thank you everyone for joining us. This is Think Tech Hawaii's Education Movers, Shakers, and Reformers. Um, next week, we're going to have another fun conversation. Um, I would like to thank, very specifically, the crew and the staff and everyone here. We have interns today as well. Everyone who helps make these shows happen. Think Tech Hawaii is an amazing resource for people who actually can pay attention and listen and engage. And I fully endorse that. Thank you. Thank you.